Welcome to the Salty Journals podcast. Salty Journals is a podcast for ocean lovers. You might be a kite surfer, surfer, sailor, freediver, spearfisher, fisher, sub rider, or just really into hanging out on the beach. The podcast brings together stories and tales from other ocean addicts. Salty Journals isn't just a podcast, it's a community bringing together all things ocean through story and experience. The cannon has gone. The cannon has gone. The hooters, the horns, the salute. Day 312, about 25 past three on April the 22nd, and Robin Knox Johnson and Sue Haley have sailed non-stop around the world. One great thing about starting a new show is the utter anonymity. No one really knows what to expect from you, including the very intrepid interviewees who probably despite their better judgment did actually get in touch with me or get back in touch with me and go ahead with the interviews. You guys are one of the very lucky few. Yes, you, you listeners, you get to stand up tall in a year or two's time and say, I was there back then when that show was cool. So we're about you know, half a minute or so into the new show. So if you discard all of those takes, the lost tapes, total screw-ups. Right now, the rest of the show is stretching out in front of us like a perfect future yet to be fulfilled. A long road, a lot of work, but we're about to head down there. We've done 15 or so interviews so far. It's been a whole range of people Everyone from multi-millionaire kite surfers through to people who've just sold it all and gone on a trip on a boat on the ocean. But more importantly, there's you guys. And there's no one else who's able to be here and say, I was there back before this, back before the last two minutes of the show, back when that was cool. Okay, so the idea with this show is stories, lots and lots of stories, some by some really polished storytellers, others just by some regular people telling their own little stories. All of these stories have one thing in common, and that's the ocean. My name's Josh, I'm the host of this show, and you are joining us as we dive into some of life's questions, big and small, with people who are driven by the connection to the ocean and their innate desire to build their lives around it. And the idea with this show is we're gonna bring you stuff you're not gonna find anywhere else. It's gonna be interviews with people who you might not actually end up expecting to see anywhere else. There's gonna be music, there's gonna be loads of great music. So let's get into this. The year 1968 remains one of the most tumultuous single years in history. It was marked by historic achievements, assassinations, we've got Martin Luther King, Kennedy, a much hated war, the Vietnam War, and a spirit of rebellion that swept through many of the countries all across the world. That all happened at the dawn of the television age. So a lot of the historic events that played out over that time happened to play out in the homes of people across the world in a way that had never been possible before. And things didn't calm down much after that either. 1969, the major news stories of that year included the Beatles' last public performance on the roof of Apple Records, the first Concorde test flight, Woodstock, as well as the first man to land on the moon. That was on the Apollo 11 mission, which was with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. So, rather fittingly, it was against this backdrop in history that the Sunday Times Golden Globe round the world race finished. And that was some of the audio you just heard before. Nine men started that race and only one man finished. That man was Sir Robin Knox Johnson. Sir Robin and his traditional 9.7 metre 
catch double-ended yacht called Suheili, who at the start was considered the most unlikely boat and given no chance. It was a funny sort of race, with no real rules, no official start line, you could set off whenever you were ready. But the prize was definitely worth having, it was 5,000 British pounds, which would be worth obviously a lot more today. And of course the achievement, well beyond the prize, which was the objective, to be the first person to single-handedly sail non-stop around the world. No easy race either. The rest of the competitors either sank, retired, or committed suicide. There was a French guy called Bernard Matissier who famously continued sailing his sturdy yacht, Joshua, great name, around Cape Horn, and then continued on for a second circuit of the uh, Southern Ocean, ending up in Tahiti to save his soul, as he put it, rather than head back to civilization, where he would have been met as a possible winner and with certain fame. Donald Crowhurst, he sailed an imaginary voyage around the world whilst actually sailing in circles in the Atlantic Ocean. He would pretty much bet everything he had, including the house, on trying to win this race, all for that prize money. So he simply transmitted fake position reports in an attempt to fool the world. Ultimately, this deception, or the goal of this deception, played out a pretty twisted story in his mind, which was all described with great detail in the second real sailing logbook that he kept on the ship, to the point where it explains where he finally slipped over the side in an apparent suicide. His boat found drifting and abandoned. The Sunday Times Golden Globe race quickly became the legend to sailors and non-sailors alike. And it's with this triumph and the tragedies and the epic human endeavour in facing the unknown that really pulls this whole story together. Sir Robin Knox Johnson was a long-term sailor himself. He joined the Merchant Navy at 17, soon becoming a deck officer with the British India Steam Navigation Company. He continues to sail and is the executive chairman of the Clipper Ventures. This is a program that he founded, which runs Clipper Around the World races, open to anyone to join the race without prior sailing experience. Sir Robin didn't get an easy ride round, obviously. He had every piece of misfortune to try to force him to retire. Polluted water supplies, smashed cabin top, collapsed boom, broken steering gear and no radio contact for months on end. It's a testament to Sir Robin's stubbornness and immense strength of character. He endures everything the world and the oceans can throw at him with a cheerful British stoicism, a cigarette or two, and a glass of brandy. He's tough as teak, intensely practical, forever diving into the sea, doing repairs, coping with constant soakings, adjusting the steering, sewing up a rip jib, and it's clear that Sir Robin's love for staying active hasn't changed at all. He's still diving, sailing, and tinkering. In fact, when we recorded this episode, out in front of him were a heap of boat parts on the table that he was going to get into later on in the day. So join me as we have a chat to Sir Robin with tales of sharks, determination, and what it's like and how to deal with long-term isolation as a having you on the show really uh, do appreciate your time you made obviously a name for yourself um being the first person to sail around the world but there was a, a life before that and how did you get started and, and and where did you get started in sailing i think boating is how i describe it really um i was saving up for a dinghy when i was eight years old but uh, it took me three years to raise the money when I'd raised it, the dinghy had gone up in price, so I couldn't buy it. Um, so at age 14, I made a canoe and started just pottering around in that. And um, when I was 17 and a half, I went to sea in the Merchant Navy. And um, my company, the British India Company, had two ships where they took all the crew off and manned them entirely with officer cadets. And so we had um, 39 of us. 
And we had to learn our trade from the bottom up. We had to qualify as able seamen and the lot. But also, they provided a whaler for us to sail in, and also dinghies, a couple of dinghies. Now, in those days, in the Merchant Navy, you had to learn to sail, because you'd have to sail the lifeboats if the ship sank. But they encouraged us to use the whaler and the dinghies to, for our own relaxation when we're in port. And really, that's, uh, I think, when I really took up sailing. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. And so, so going from taking up sailing um, and having your own, your own um, experience on the, on the boats, how, how did you get to deciding to um, be involved with the, the, or do the Golden Globe and, and sail long distance like that? Well, it all um, started when I was based with the company um, out of India, running from Bombay to Basra. And um, a chap had been on cadetship with me, Pete Jordan, who lives in Melbourne, um, and I, we happened to get on the same ship together. And we discussed what we do at the end of our two and a half year spells. And we, as we were just chatting, I was taking over the watch from him at midnight, and a Dow came into sight. And uh, that started us thinking, how about we buy a Dow and sail home from India back to the UK? Well, um, that developed. Um, I wrote to a chap called Adam Villiers and said, what do you think of this idea? He wrote me a charming letter back. He, he was a very well-known um, square root sailor. Uh, came from Tasmania, I think. And um, saying, look, don't do that because there'll be no value in the boat. And I don't expect you young merchant Navy officers can afford that. Buy yourselves a yacht and do it. So we thought about that. And that seemed good advice. So we... Um, sent off some plans in England, um, they arrived back out in India. And we found a boatyard there and we said, okay, let's build a boat. So we started building the boat and um, she was a bit late, uh, probably unsurprising. <laughs> we missed the monsoon. Pete and the other guy, Mike Leddingham, who retired to New Zealand, uh, pulled out. And I picked up with my brother and a friend and, um, um, and um, we sailed back from India via Arabia, Africa, South Africa, and then non-stop from Cape Town to London. Now, it was doing that that we heard about Francis Chichester, who was sailing non well, non-stop as far as Australia, single-handed. And I suppose, you know, you looked at it and thought, I was 29 years old. Um, you looked at it and said, well, hang on. That leaves one thing left to be done. That's to go around non-stop. And I thought about it. By this time, I was first officer on a passenger liner called the Kenya. And I started thinking, hey, you know, I've got the boat. Um, I've got the skills. I've got experience. I've sailed 20,000 miles across oceans now, apart from my career, nearly 14 years at sea. I'm probably as qualified as anyone to do this. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll have a go at it. So I wrote um, letters to 52 companies suggesting I would be a good person to sponsor. And they all came back and said no. Um, well, it wasn't quite a disaster. Tenants Lager gave me 120 cans and Cadbury's gave me a five pound voucher. So um, I did get some sponsorship, but that was it. Um, and I got on with my preparations. And um, I was a reservist, so I spent five months on a frigate and uh, at the end of that time, finished getting my boat ready. And um, in the meantime, the Sunday Times newspaper had heard of a group of us planning on doing this. At that time, four of us, that'd be March 68. So without consulting us, they suddenly announced we were in a race they were organizing. I never actually joined their race. I mean, they, they announced I was in it. Um, but, you know, they said... Uh, well, the race is going to start in October, at the end of October. And he said, absolutely not. No way am I going to start that late. That means going around Cape Horn at the end of uh, summer, early autumn, bad time. If I leave in June, I can get around Cape Horn in midsummer in the Southern Ocean, which makes sense. So I said, well, um, sorry, but I'm going at the beginning of June. And they said to me, oh, you won't be able to be in our race then. I said, well, you're catching on fast, pal. But I'm not going to risk, I'm not going to risk my, my life for your deadlines. So they changed the rules. And um, I wasn't the only one who said that. And uh, they announced then you could go between the 1st of June and the 31st of October. But they'd um, 
it, they'd have a prize for the first person, the Golden Globe Trophy. And to make it interesting, they said it'd be five thousand pounds. It's probably worth about eighty thousand nowadays uh, for the fastest person to do it between the, leaving it between those times. So um, that was it. I was the third person to set off on the fourteenth of June. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And um, can you can you let us know a bit about the the trip? Um, obviously, the, the, there was some 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 points of of challenge along the way. Um, the the actual path. Um, that you had to take, which which way was that um, from from the UK? Well, I took the. Uh, in fact, we all took the old uh, sailing ship route towards Australia. So you leave the UK, you turn left, go down the Atlantic, get level with South Africa, turn left, and keep going till you see Australia. Um, and that's the standard route. The wind's largely with you there. Um, briefly in the south, uh, southern Atlantic, it doesn't, but otherwise it's largely with you. So uh, it's a sensible route to take, really. Um, being early, I got into the Roaring Forties in September, which was a bit early, and I had uh, six gales in 10 days, which smashed things up a bit, moved the cabin, started to leak, um, smashed up my self-steering, which I managed to repair. Um, but prior to that, um, in the early days, I realized the boat was leaking quite a lot. So um, when I got to the equator, the doldrums, where there's very little wind, uh, I went overside and tacked a strip along a seam that I knew was leaking. So you'd um, knock holes in a bit of copper. Then you'd uh, go down with the tack, take a deep breath, go down with the tack, bang the tack in, come back up, get some air, grab another tack, go down, put another tack in. And this took me about two days during which a shark came along and expressed rather too much interest for my liking. So um, I went back on deck because I didn't like the way he was getting agitated. And uh, he wouldn't go away. So I threw some lavatory paper into the sea. God, you know, I could have got a house for that lavatory paper nowadays. <laughs> um, and of course, when he came up to the surface to uh, see what it was, his head just cleared the surface. And I put a 303 bullet into his head. Um, he sank, and I waited a while just to make sure blood or anything hadn't attracted any others. I managed to carry on and finish the job off. But that was my main worry. You're so focused on putting the tax in, you just occasionally look around and you say, oh, hell, yeah, didn't want you for company. And he's just swimming around looking at you. Quite a, quite a worrying feeling. For those who, who are listening to the podcast and might not know, um, you, you lost the self steering um, in in one of the gales as well. Um, do you mind telling us a little bit more about about that? Well, the boat was knocked over on a side, um, and it smashed up one of the vanes. Um, and that was all right. I carried a spare, uh, but I had to wait because it's quite a large bit of plywood, and you didn't want to be the first hang glider in the Roaring Forties. But also, the rudder broke, and I had to dive in and fix it. Now that. God, it was cold. Oh, jeez, it was cold. Um, but I was very thoughtful. I left a bottle of brandy on the deck. So the moment I got back up, I had a bloody good swig. And I watched my colour change from blue to red again. Um, God, it was bloody cold, though. Um, but anyway, so I fixed it. And it worked on until just before I got to Australia. And I was coming up to King Island. And I, my intention was, because my radio had broken by then, I could receive, but I couldn't transmit. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go up towards Melbourne and contact the pilot vessel and ask him if he'd report me, just to say, no one's heard anything of me for two months. I'm fine, and I'm carrying on. Well, I did that, and I went up to the Melbourne pilot vessel. And I said, uh, they looked at us, somewhat interested, a yacht coming in. And I said, will you take my mail? So he basically told me to F off. And I said, look, mate, um, I'm 145 days out from the UK. Um, would you mind taking some mail for me? And he said, where? I said, UK, England. Oh, yeah? Yeah, all right, then hang around. We'll hire a boat. So while they're lying about, he said, where are you heading? I said, well, towards New Zealand. And he said, uh, what, across the Tasman? But actually, there is no other way of heading to New Zealand from Australia in a boat except across the Tasman. But 
Anyway, I said, well, yes. He said, Christ, mate, you'd be careful. That's bloody dangerous. He wasn't the least impressed with the fact I'd sailed all the way from England. He was worrying about me crossing the Tasman. So um, anyway, I survived the Tasman, um, ran into a, a, well, a storm off New Zealand, um, which uh, was pretty frightening. Um, managed to get past uh, the southern end. I went between Stewart Island and South Island off Bluff. Um, met a ferry who did see me and reported me, which was great. Um, went out towards Dunedin because uh, I heard they were looking for me in an aeroplane and I thought, in this weather, that's not clever. And I was heading in towards Dunedin and uh, I, w I was watching everything but the bottom and I went aground. So the next five hours I sat there waiting for the tide to come in to get me off. So if you like, it wasn't quite nonstop. There was a five hour hiatus in, of Dunedin. I, I suppose there would have been, you know, the whole a whole different range of feelings. Um, but I think for, for me and probably many of the listeners, there would, you know, running aground or or losing the steering would have been, would have been enough to to send them um, back to the nearest port and and back home. And um, how how do you um or yeah how do you mentally deal with the the apprehension and the the fear at times like that? I mean, what's what what pushes you on? You know, it, it wasn't apprehension, really. Um, here's a problem. Now, how am I going to deal with it? Because I got that far. You know, I'd, I'd equaled the longest voyage ever made in a yacht. And I felt, I've come this far, don't give up now. I have too much to lose. So when I was off Dunedin and um, a journalist came out and chatted to me, and uh, oh, he, he brought some mail out for me. And I said, well, hand it over. He said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? He said, no, they've changed the rules. If I give you this mail, it counts as outside assistance. Oh, for God's sake. So he sat on a boat about five yards away, opening the letters and reading them to me. Um, but, you know, there was no question I was going to carry on. I, I got no doubts at all. I got this far. Uh, let's go for it. And I also found out that the Frenchman who I was worrying about was about four or five weeks behind me. And I, if I held, it only gained five weeks since he'd started. Now, and I was getting better and faster. But he was tended. To, he seemed to be slowing up. I thought, well, I'm not giving up now. There's too much to lose. Uh, so I headed off. And of course, with no radio, um, no one heard anything from me for about four and a half months. In fact, the Sunday Times wrote a sort of obituary. Um, I was very disappointed in it. I could have written a far better one. <laughs> well, well, that's a uh, yeah. It's pretty, pretty, um, pretty serious if people are writing obituaries about you by that point in time. Uh, absolutely. Um, and you know, now obviously having having taken that that magnificent trip and and um, you, you know, being able to complete such an achievement like that. I mean, what. What uh, you know? What 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 sort of drives you beyond that now? Are you are you still on the water? Obviously, are you um, you know still find time to sail? Not enough. Since then, I've done six two-handed round Britain races, seven crossings of the North Atlantic. No, seven two-handed. I've done twenty-five crossings of the North Atlantic. Yeah. Done a whip red race, uh, the Jules Verne that Peter Blake and I were the only non French to ever held that record for the fastest circumnavigation. That was in '94. We did it in just under 75 days at average speed of 14.8 knots. That's now almost been halved, which shows you how things have developed, which is fascinating. And then in '06, I did a single handed race around the world again. Um, in a 60 footer, that was much, much faster. Um, I've since then done four Sydney Hobarts, one China Sea race, transatlantic race, or two transatlantic race, one single handed, one with crew. Um, and last year, sailed up to Greenland with some friends to go diving under some icebergs. That's fantastic. Absolutely unbelievably beautiful. And of course you can get up there now, the ice isn't as thick. 
you know, people say there's no global warming, bollocks. You can see it up there. And um, I might well go to Greenland again next year. Once the lockdown finishes this year, I can't do much because the clipper race, which I run, we've had to call a stop to that. So it's, it's left the boats in Subic Bay in the Philippines. And of course, you have to go with the seasons of the year. So we have to wait a full year. So I'm going to have very little to do once the lockdown finishes. So there's a bit of a discussion between my daughter and I. Um, she'd like to go south towards Portugal. And I'd like to go north towards the Faroes. So we'll have to wait and see who wins on that one. She'll uh, bring the grandchildren, which will be great. I took one of the grandchildren to Greenland with me. He had a lovely time. Great to have him along. Um, introduce him. He's not a sailor yet, but uh, he loved it. But he was catching fish in Scoresby Sund, which is right up in the Arctic Circle. And they were ugly as hell, so we're chucking him back in the water. And then we discovered later on they're a delicacy. I don't think he's forgiven me for not saving them and putting them in the freezer so he can make some money. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and what was the sort of landmark moment for, for um, teaching your daughter how to sail? I mean, how did, you, how did you get her started with that? Well, when I went around the world, I was divorced. Um, uh, I don't think I'd have done it if I'd still been married. Um, I think, you know, one would have felt, well, we had a daughter. We never fell out about her. And um, after I got back, you know, we slowly got together again. And then we got remarried, which is one of my better moves. And so sailing was what I did. So daughter didn't really get much choice in the matter. And um, she always talked uh, when she was young about the fact, well, can't we go somewhere where there's dancing or this or that? The other, why? We're on the west coast of Scotland. This is beautiful, lovely cruising. Oh, Dad, where's the, where's the town? Now, of course, she turns around and says, God, there was such good times. I said, you didn't say that at the time. But she... Um, did a lot of sailing with me. She crossed the Atlantic with me once in a race. Um, no, she sails with me. She's quite good on a boat, actually. Um, if I've got her with me, I'm fairly relaxed because I know she knows what she's doing. Mm. Having spent so much time on, on the ocean, obviously there's a lot of um, mythology and superstitions that, that kind of circle around. Is there, is there any you do pay, uh, pay penance to, any of them that you would, you would believe in? Well, you know, I'm, uh, of course I'm not in the least superstitious, but... If I could remember it was Friday the 13th, I probably wouldn't sail. But I never seem to notice them too late. I mean, there are all these superstitions, but uh, frankly, I don't let them worry me too much. I mean, uh, there's certain things which are natural. There's certain times of the year when it's not a good idea to be doing a particular voyage. Well, you can bring up, a, you can invent a superstition to describe that, but actually there's a good natural reason for it. So um, when you hear about these superstitions, it's always worth saying, what's behind that? What's the reason for that? Now, I've never heard a reason why it's bad to sail on Friday the 13th. But I do know there's good reasons why you don't want to start crossing the Atlantic late in the year. So, you know, it, it's all sort of, it's there, but it isn't, if you know what I mean. You know, obviously, uh, at, at this time, there's, there's, there's some people who are finding the isolation of, of uh, COVID-19 and, and the situation of spending a lot of time at home uh, as, as a bit challenging. Um, so I, I think who better to ask some advice of than, than somebody who voluntarily has put themselves into isolation on a boat and, and sailed around the world. Um, so any tips for maintaining, um, you know, good health and, and sanity for, for those kind of voyages? But of course, when I was on my own, I had a purpose and I had a job to do. I had a boat to sail, to navigate. No satellites in those days. Um, I had to feed myself. I had to keep the boat properly maintained, make sure she's on the right course. I steered for quite a lot of time. Um, so that, I think, is the secret of it all, because, because I had something to do. I was occupied, and therefore I wasn't so aware of the loneliness. About the only time I really wondered what the hell I was doing was off Australia because my receiver worked and I was picking up dance music on a Saturday night and thinking what the hell am I doing out here I should be out chasing the Sheilas but um, that was not to be but um, the um, I think the answer you know to this isolation is get a project get something to do something that interests you that something that um, you know that you'll just you'll suddenly notice the day's gone because you've been absorbed by it 
you can find a project like that or a number of projects that just keep you occupied. You'll find the day passes quite quickly and all of a sudden it's the evening again and you're making yourself a meal and next after that, and this is a good film on, you're going to bed. And then you get up the next morning and say, oh yeah, I'm getting on with that project. And actually, fact, the time passes quite well. I've been in lockdown now for 22 days since I got back from the Philippines. I've been out once for 40 minutes just to walk, um, but they've asked us not to do that, so I haven't been out since. Um, and, you know, I'm stuck here in the house, and I'm overhauling the garden furniture. There's bits of boat on the kitchen table, which is the best place to work, about to be painted. Um, there's all sorts of things going on just to sort of get them done. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I, I can definitely relate to that. There's a lot of lot of house uh, work that's been done over this this past two weeks, that's for sure. Um, a lot of jobs have been putting off for a long time, but are suddenly finding new meaning. And what what's 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 next for you once um once this uh, this isolation clears? It sounds like there could be a trip to to Portugal or um, perhaps north again on the cards. Have you got some other um, plans in the pipeline? Other projects coming? Well, we'll certainly do that. Um, I will go sailing. It's um, I normally like to look for places I can go diving as well. Um, but because I've got all the kit on the boat, so I can charge my cylinders and go where I feel like. Of course, you live in our climate, you need a dry suit. Um, not so bad for you down in Australia, but uh, up here the water is very cold. Um, but, uh, you know, I should go off probably maybe two months. There's nothing I can do at the moment. We've, I've got a very good team with Clipper, an excellent team of really good professional guys. And they're not just, they're not employees, they're friends. And we've really got it pretty well under control. We're just finalizing all the arrangements for the restart, just getting the next program sorted out. We'll have that sorted out in the next two, three weeks, tell the crews what the score is, when to rejoin, where we're heading, what the program is. And once we've done that, Really, there's nothing much we can do apart from training people up, which we will be doing once the lockdown's down. Um, we do a lot of training because they have to do four weeks training before I let them go. Um, there's not much I can really do until we go back out to Subic Bay, recommission the fleet. We've got two people out there looking after them. Uh, recommission the fleet and get the crews out, give them a refresher, and then send them off probably to China. It'll be the first stop, Sanya in China. Uh, in other words, we'll pick up where the route was this year, or was meant to be this year. So that'll then keep me totally occupied, because once the race is on, I usually go to all the ports. I like to keep in touch with the crews, see how they're getting on, make sure they haven't forgotten their knots, um, make sure they remember how to do things on the boats, um, and, you know, go to the ports, meet the people, our hosts in the ports. And uh, In fact, I enjoy it. I enjoy it actually as much as anything watching people develop confidence on the boats. You know, 40% have never been on a boat before. I have to say they're the easiest to train because they've got no bad habits. So we, uh, we can bring them up much more quickly. But um, watching them gain confidence, you know, when they cross the North Pacific in March, April, it's tough. That is a nasty ocean. That is as good as the Southern Ocean, or as bad, if you like. And you watch them coming in at the end, and you, they're standing there a little bit taller. They know they sail 5,000 miles across one of the biggest oceans in the world, and, you know, with quite a lot of bad weather. And they have now something to be proud of, and I'm proud of them. If people would like to look into to joining the Clipper, what, what's, um, what's your advice for them, and, and where would they go to, to start? Well, I think the best thing to do is just look up Clipper. Uh, Clipper Ventures is the name of the company, and just log in with us. Um, we're we're going to be starting training people shortly. Um, so, for instance, Australians would say, look, uh, we're probably going to do some training in Subic Bay in the Philippines. Uh, if you come there four weeks ahead, we'll put you through the full training so that um, when the race restarts, you're fully ready for it. We've got the time to do it. I mean, I can start training next October in Subic. We'll have started training here by then in the UK, uh, probably sooner than that, as soon as we can. But uh, we put the few, some courses together in Subic Bay. Not a bad spot either. I mean, I uh, don't know if any of you guys have been to Subic Bay. There's nine very interesting wrecks on the bottom of that harbour. And they're great diving. And we dived on the ex-USS New York 
which was scuttled to prevent it becoming falling into the Japanese hands. She's about 80 feet. Still see the eight-inch guns on her down there. I mean, it's just fantastic. A good good point. I mean, obviously you've 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 sailed around and then had the opportunity to jump over the side and and jump into the water at, at times. Um, any any other dive spots that really stand out for you? I think, like most divers, the most exciting thing to dive on is actually a wreck. Um, so if you can find a wreck, you can dive on. Um, last year we went down to the Scillies. That's the islands off the southwest of England. Um, eight of us took the boat, and um, we decided we'd try and find a cannon because there's over a 1,000 wrecks on the city, so there's got to be 20,000, 30,000 cannons down there. Well, that didn't work out. Um, <laughs> uh, I got some new equipment, and I was diving with another guy, and he said, boy, Robin's good. He went down like a rocket there. He didn't realize I was totally out of control and came up in a little fissure in the rocks. And he wondered what had happened. He just saw bubbles coming out of the weed. I, I was looking for my inflator. <laughs> Bloody new equipment. Where's the damned inflator? <laughs> so I could pop up. I thought, uh, maybe I should just go and practice with this a little bit more. I was only in about 20 feet. I mean, it was quite safe, but uh, it was uh, amusing. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. Have you had any other um, near misses or anything else that's been a bit scary about, about diving other than the uh, that episode with the inflator? Not really. Um, you know, it's, uh, I was using that kit out in Subic uh, two months ago, so I'm very happy with that. Um, no, I, I think um, it, it's just that wonderful three-dimensional feel when you get underwater. I mean, you can move in which direction you like. Just obey the very sensible rules we have, you know, about staying down for too long, one thing and another. And if you do that, absolutely fine. Any time I've been really deep was with a an Australian actually called Bruce Beaton, who lives somewhere in Western Australia. He and I went down to 220 feet, once off Muscat. But we were only down there for a few minutes just to see what it was like, and then we popped up rather slowly. And uh, But it's just great to do it. I mean, it's just that wonderful three-dimensional feeling. Um, anything else you would like to like to mention? Anything else we should be, should be covering off? Um, you know, I know we're pointing people to... To Clipper, um, but is there anything else like that you would like to highlight and have on the show? I just say to everyone, if, um, if you haven't tried boating or sailing, and I don't mind if it's higher boating either, it's, uh, it's getting out on a boat that matters. If you haven't tried it, go and try it. It's one of the most relaxing, friendly occupations. You know, we go to the Fremantle Sailing Club every two years. Great club, very friendly, lovely people, and um, Actually, I've never got out to Rocknest Island. Sail past it, never stopped there. I must go and do that sometime. But um, just take up boating. It's just such a wonderfully relaxing thing. And, of course, freedom. You're in charge. You're the one who decides where you're going, how you're going to get there, and who's going with you. And there's no bloody bureaucrat telling you what you've got to do. Yeah, that's a, probably a good, good point to end on. I think I t totally agree. <laughs> absolutely I hope you guys enjoyed the interview as much as I did in recording it certainly interesting chatting to a guy with that many years experience on the water and understanding a bit more about what it drives him and what keeps him out there there's plenty of great resources out there to go and learn a bit more about this race and, and what happened a uh, good starting point is the book by Sir Robin a world of my own there's also a book by Bernard Matissier, The Long Way. And um, there's a film called The Mercy, which is made by the BBC with Colin Firth, which tells the story of Donald Crowhurst. It's a fairly recent one, 2017. It's well worth a watch. I'll include all of this in the show notes. So go have a look there. Feel free to have a bit of a look around the website, www.saltyjournals.com.